Welcome to Sketchy EBM. I'm your host, Anthony Crocco, and today we're continuing our three-part series on clinical decision instruments. In the first episode, we talked about derivation studies, and in this, episode two, we're going to talk about validation. You may remember that one of my take-home messages from episode one was that an unvalidated clinical decision instrument should not be used in clinical practice. You may also remember that there are three stages in the developmental process of a clinical decision instrument. The first being the derivation study, which is followed by the validation studies, which is then followed by impact analysis. And today we're talking about the validation studies. The first question that we need to answer is why bother doing validation studies in the first place? I've never done one of these myself, but I'd be willing to guess that they cost a lot of money, take a lot of time, and take a lot of effort, so there better be some good reasons. Well, as it turns out, there are. The first, and in my mind most important reason, is that we don't know if the seemingly important candidate variables from the derivation study were in fact significant. The results may have occurred by chance alone, and as such, we need to confirm or validate the results. A second reason why a validation study is important is that we want to make sure that the clinical decision instrument works in a different population than the population used in the derivation study. The new population may have a different prevalence or spectrum of disease, and we want to make sure that this clinical decision instrument is going to be useful for pretty much every population that it might be applied to. One final thing that I think about is that when clinical decision instruments are derived, they're done so usually with a retrospective data set by researchers, looking at a number of candidate variables. We now have a clinical decision instrument, which hopefully is fairly simple and straightforward, and we need to make sure that that data can be collected properly by clinicians in the front lines. With these reasons in mind, how do we go about validating a clinical decision instrument? In very simple terms, we need to take the clinical decision instrument and apply it to the population of patients for which it was intended. We then follow the patient population forward and measure the outcomes, whether they're diagnostic or prognostic, and see how well that clinical decision instrument performed. You might hear a couple of terms bandied about when people describe validation studies. You may hear of internal or external validation studies. Internal validation studies are usually studies that are done on the same population that was used for the derivation study, whereas external validation studies are validation studies that are done on a different population. I generally like external validation studies because I want to make sure that this decision instrument works in different populations. Another way to subdivide validation studies is by calling them narrow or diverse. Narrow studies usually involve a very specific group of patients that may or may not reflect the patients that you see in your practice, and for this reason, I don't like them as much. Diverse studies, on the other hand, have a broader range of patients and should apply to a broader range of clinical situations. At the end of the day, a validation study will probably give you some very specific information about the clinical decision instrument. The data may be reported to you using terms like sensitivity, specificity, likelihood ratios, be them positive or negative, and odds ratios. And these are all things that we're going to cover in other videos. Before we go, however, I do want to mention a few things I need you to look out for when you're reading a validation study. The first thing that we want to do is make sure that the patients that were included in the validation study were selected in a non-biased fashion. You want to make sure that they really represent the patients that you might be seeing. Next, we want to make sure that whoever was using the clinical decision instrument didn't know the outcome of the patient because if they did know the outcome of the patient, they might be biased in how they use the instrument, and that might mess up our data. As a counterpoint to this, we want to make sure that whoever was establishing the gold standard or criterion standard for this outcome didn't know how the patient performed on the clinical decision instrument. Again, because if they know how the patient performed on the clinical decision instrument, they may be biased in how they report the gold or criterion standard. We should also make sure that any subjective measures in the clinical decision instrument have been appropriately shown to have good inter-rater or inter-physician reliability. One last thing that we should look at with the validation study is follow-up. We want to make sure that the researchers followed up 100% of the patients enrolled in the study, otherwise the results are going to be significantly compromised. So hopefully now you have a bit of a better understanding of why we need validation studies, how they're done, and some of the things we look for to make sure they're done properly. We need to now take it to the next step. In episode three, we're gonna talk about impact analysis and why this final stage, albeit difficult to perform, is important in making sure that a clinical decision instrument is ready for prime time. Thank you for watching this episode of Sketchy EBM. Please do take the time to evaluate and as always, draw your own conclusions. Oh,